Welcome back to Metabolic Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Metabolic Mind is a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group, where we're exploring the intersection of metabolic health and mental health. And today I'm joined by Dr. Guido Frank to discuss this concept of nutritional ketosis as a potential therapy for anorexia nervosa and eating disorders. And we have other videos about this topic that, that as I say in each one, it sort of gives me chills to talk about. And I'm going to keep saying that because, because any type of dietary therapy or certainly food restriction is thought of as an absolute contraindication for eating disorders, especially anorexia. But nutritional ketosis is different. Nutritional ketosis actually changes the fuel in our brain. It changes our metabolism. It changes our physiology and therefore could be a potential treatment well beyond like any diet, right? Well beyond that. So so Dr. Frank is going to explore that with us, and he's going to talk about a study that he is going to start enrolling soon to study this exact topic. But first, a quick background of, of Dr. Guido Frank. He is a clinician and researcher at UCSD, and he's a professor of psychiatry, board certified in adult, adolescent, and child psychiatry with a focus on eating disorders, also trained in psychotherapy. Uh, so really has this wonderful balance of clinician, knowing the medications, knowing the therapy um, interventions, and knowing the research and conducting the research. So I'm really excited to hear about this research study he is going to be conducting to look further at this topic. Now, we already have a video with Dr. Frank, along with Dr. Skolnick and Dr. Lori Calbresi, talking about their five-person pilot study that they published showing nutritional ketosis being effective in these five people as a nutritional intervention. So they're building upon that with this next study that Dr. Frank is going to talk about in this interview. Now, real quick, before we get to the interview, please remember our channels for informational purposes only. We're not playing, providing individual or group medical or healthcare advice or establishing a provider-patient relationship. Many of the interventions we discuss can have potentially dramatic or dangerous effects if done without proper supervision. So always consult your healthcare provider before changing your diet, your medications, or any of your, of your healthcare interventions. So now let's get to this interview. And I think it's really important a number of concepts he talks about. And one thing that, that I think helps frame it is, you know, anorexia is sort of a, a dual pronged disease you can think about. There's the weight loss, which is the physically very dangerous and potentially life-threatening condition, but there's also the thought process side of it. And, you know, one fuels the other. And so Dr. Frank's going to talk about that in his interview, but I just wanted to preface it as I think that's an important distinction. But now let's get into this interview with Dr. Guido Frank. Well, Dr. Frank, I really appreciate you coming back on to talk to us today. And in the intro, I referenced our other video and interview with you about the, the pilot study that you helped uh, write up um, along with some of the others, Dr. Calabrese, Dr. Skolnick, and others. But I wanted to, to take a step back with you now and, and talk to you about sort of the scope of the problem or the scope of the issue with eating disorders and anorexia and the, the high mortality rate and the, the current level of care and, you know, what it gets right, what it, what it gets wrong, what sort of is needed. And then through that discussion, sort of we'll transition a little bit into the talk about nutrition and nutritional ketosis. So I know that's a big topic to start with, but if you could sort of give us a summary of that, I think it would really help set the stage for the rest of the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Brett, for this opportunity again. Uh, eating disorders are very common in the population, and anorexia nervosa is one of those eating disorders It's associated with severe emaciation and has one of the highest death rates among all psychiatric disorders. And while the problem has been known for quite some time, you really have no biological treatments for anorexia nervosa. And we have a set of behavior treatments. Of course, when somebody is underweight, uh, there is the, 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 the need to refeed and so forth. If you allow me this, this term or nutritional rehabilitation, rather. Um, but the problem, I think, is really uh, finding out about mechanism and finding out new treatment directions to help those folks. And I've been doing behavioral and brain imaging research for quite some time. I've been also trained psychotherapy. So I'm, I'm very unbiased when it comes to what treatment uh, might work, uh, whether medication, whether behavior, things like that. But I think 
we are a bit at a at a standstill in how can we really support these behavior interventions with improving biological mechanisms that might be reinforcing the illness. Uh, we have been working off a model uh, where we think about there are usually certain triggers that make a person change their eating behavior. And that can be manifold. That can be um, somebody who just uh, wants to get better in soccer, exercises more over summer, uh, eats maybe a little bit less, and then three months later that person has anorexia nervosa. There are other people who learn health class that certain foods are not good for you. They have maybe a family history about uh, of heart attacks or metabolic problems, and then they get you know get nervous, right? And then they want to do the right thing, and then they cut out certain foods, and then all of a sudden they have a severe severe eating disorder. Others uh, they may be overweight, want to lose some weight. Others they have been maybe abused. They feel uncomfortable in their body. And then they change their eating behavior. And what they have in common is, while they, they come from so different directions, if you wish, uh, many of those then develop eating problems uh, such as anorexia nervosa. And uh, that, I think, makes one think, what are maybe common biological threads that, that those individuals share? And from a sort of cognitive conscious perspective, what all of those folks share is that they have negatively biased uh, uh, to food, right? Because there's something they want to change about their eating. But what really happens is when you lose a lot of weight, when you restrict and then your weight goes down, you lose um, muscle mass, you lose uh, probably brain mass as well, there will be a a reinforcing process uh, that gets set in motion probably by a, uh, by a uh, change in how the dopaminergic system works and how dopamine receptors affect your thinking. But that's probably not everything about it. Uh, another big aspect is that what we have learned is that folks with eating disorders, they tend to be uh, you know, they're hard workers. They usually do well in school. They tend to be perfectionistic. They are very um, into doing the right thing in many ways. But if you are really motivated doing things the right way, uh, you might also be more anxious. And uh, when you are more anxious, that creates stress. And uh, sort of an extension of, of our model is now that stress probably interferes with brain homeostasis, probably with brain metabolism. And uh, just to give you a little story on the side, so I had a, um, an outpatient clinic in the past, and what I noticed was every August, several of my patients relapsed. And what happens in August, school starts, right? So supporting the notion that stress that's even unrelated to shape and weight and eating related issues really seems to be a driver of the eating disorder. And so I've been thinking this, about this for a long time. And then I was fortunate to, to learn about uh, metabolism in psychiatric illnesses and got involved in this paper that you mentioned. And I've been thinking uh, a lot about that. And uh, there is good animal research research uh, that would support that when you are having a very high stress level, then this might interfere with your glucose metabolism in the brain. And when you have a lot of stress and you work very hard, the brain, however, needs more glucose. <laughs> so think about you're somebody who really works hard, wants to do the right thing. You need more, more glucose in the brain. And you may have noticed that yourself. You work on a project, right? And you see yourself maybe eating something extra because you, you need some additional uh, uh, food for your, for your brain. Um, but think about it. You're vulnerable that this high stress interferes with how your brain actually can utilize the sugar, right? And, uh, and that's then where the problem might come in. And uh, on the other hand, if you restrict, if you lose weight, uh, by not eating as much, then your body uses up your own resources 
and you create ketones, uh, ketone bodies that the brain can use for energy uh, usage. However, of course, if you keep doing that, then you deprive yourself and you might kill yourself by self-starvation. And I think that's where using ketogenic diet uh, related therapies might be really extremely helpful in normalizing, uh, supporting a energy homeostasis in the brain. So people do not get into these stress states, which then uh, may help with anxiety, depression, and in our case, eating disorder behaviors. Yeah, you can definitely see your your true colors as, a, as someone who really loves the mechanisms and the research of the mechanisms coming out in the way you answered that. You really connected the dots well on why you think that um, why you think it happens in terms of eating disorders and energy regulation and how ketones can help regulate that. But at its core, you know, nutritional ketosis is still thought of as a diet, as a restrictive diet. And we've heard through a number of our other interviews and videos that you know, restrictive diets are contraindicated in anorexia and eating disorders. But now that whole concept is starting to change with sort of reframing this as therapeutic nutritional ketosis of changing the fuel of the brain, of changing the body's metabolism and the brain's metabolism. So I'm just curious from your standpoint, because I want to hear about the study that you're doing, um, that you're proposing to study this in more detail. But has there been resistance and did you have some internal resistance about this concept of using a diet to treat anorexia and having to get over that to realize that it's not just a diet, but it's a therapeutic intervention? Yeah, that's that's a really great point. I think, first of all, we have to change maybe our thinking in this context, a diet uh, perspective from a losing weight perspective to a actually medical intervention perspective. I think we really have to change our, our thinking or how we conceptualize this intervention. Uh, we call it therapeutic uh, ketogenic diets to, to make it clear, it's not about weight loss, but it's about a therapy. And you know, think about you have an illness and you need to take a certain medication. Not everybody needs to take that certain medication, right? Only certain people and for a certain amount of time. And I think about the ketogenic diet intervention um, of it similarly, you know, it is, I think about it as a potentially highly impactful and helpful intervention for somebody who is vulnerable to certain metabolic um, uh, changes, let's say, especially when you lose weight, especially when you are, are uh, high stressed and, and so forth. So, uh, of course, the worry is that if somebody who is, uh, underweight and takes a diet, that person might uh, might lose even more weight. And uh, so, how we have so there are different ways how you can can um, that I think it's important to look at it. First of all, the diet is meant to sustain the weight, the amount of of nutrition about uh, of energy you take in clearly is designed that you um, have enough calories if you wish that you have enough energy that you do not lose weight. And in the study that you mentioned, I get to it in a moment, uh, it is uh, a, a criterion of continua continuation of the study that people do not lose weight. So it's, it's designed for that purpose. But the other important aspect is to, uh, as we're very cognizant about this potential problem, we want to be very safe and um, for the study, we want to recruit and include individuals who are actually not underweight anymore at that point. Those folks um, have been underweight or were underweight at some point. They have uh, partially recovered, at least weight-wise. Yeah, they're at least at the lower threshold of normal. However, those folks are uh, still highly preoccupied with shape and weight. They, they are concerned about uh, weight gain because these these thoughts and cognitions these they are so ingrained and uh, you 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 know I often ask my patients so how much are you preoccupied how much do you think about every day about shape and weight and things and um, people often say the whole day right all day long I'm preoccupied and that's exactly a 
symptom, that's exactly behavior where we have absolutely no good treatment for, where we have absolutely no good intervention. And uh, so we recruit individuals who still have all the anorexia nervosa uh, symptoms except for the currently severe low weight. And we want to address this concern. But again, folks, um, if they're interested, they go through a screening, uh, they get consented, everything runs through the University of California, San Diego. They have uh, baseline assessments uh, with myself. They would have lab testing to make sure that liver, kidney, and so forth are, are doing well. And uh, then folks would get enrolled in the study. Uh, the study also involves weekly meetings with a dietitian. And uh, that person very closely monitors the foods. The foods are actually provided. So we have a, a commercial provider of those foods. So it wouldn't cost the individual anything to, to buy those foods. And uh, then we have weekly assessments for weight, uh, for uh, ketosis, how much somebody is, is, has gotten into the state of ketosis, where the body then really, instead of using sugar, uses ketone bodies for energy generation. So is this a single arm study where everybody gets nutritional ketosis or, or there's, is there more than one arm? That's correct. That's a single arm study. Uh, it is very hard to come up with a control, <laughs> control intervention where somebody would not know whether that person is in the therapeutic ketogenic diet intervention or not. Uh, and, but on the other hand, uh, over the, the past 50 years, let's say, that anorexia nervosa has been really in people's minds and, and people have been researching this. There has been no good, good treatment and many treatments um, that, that have been tried to treat these cognitions, um, they, they have not been overly successful. These thoughts are extremely hard to, to control. So um, I would think if you respond to the, the ketogenic diet intervention, uh, it, it is not likely that somebody would just respond out of a placebo effect. I highly would doubt that. And I also should qualify something. I said there are no good treatments out. That's, that's not quite correct uh, because we have good behavior interventions, but they are just very limited, let's put it that way. And I think we need a biological arm to support those. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. So how many people are you looking to recruit and how long is the study intervention? Yeah, so we look to include uh, 40 individuals. They have a two-week um, ketogenic diet induction after the screening processes. And then uh, they would go through 12 weeks of full ketogenic diet with weekly visits and uh, checkups and see how people are doing, that their mood is all right, and so forth. Uh, they uh, meet so with the dietitian, the psychiatrist, the peer counselor, and, um, and then we assess over time how a person's behavior in terms, especially in terms of thoughts, cognitions, feeling around eating shape and weight and improve. And what, I'm, and, and what I started to think is, is whether the restriction state creates a, almost an addictive factor. You lose weight and you have these ketones that get released and you want to have more of those because you feel they're helpful for your, your energy. You feel uh, having more energy, literally. And I'm hoping that the uh, ketogenic diet with providing these ketones through the, the meals that folks then feel similarly relieved in a way and they do not need to restrict anymore because they get the, the therapeutic intervention, the medicine, if you wish, in that case, through their food, their diet. And is this a virtual study or do people have to be local and present in San Diego? So this will be uh, a study where people can largely do it virtual. Uh, for the initial assessment, uh, we uh, probably will have a person come to our lab. We have been working with our institutional review board on that, but they, they, they didn't feel very comfortable with all virtual. So we at least uh, wants to meet with folks in the beginning at the first visit so we can take a weight in person. Uh, we, we do the labs here and things like that. However, to make this as easy as possible, uh, we do this, we can do this largely via um, 
Zoom or other uh, approved platforms. And uh, people get a scale, for instance, mailed to them where they can take weights every week and they don't see the weight. So we just get that uploaded uh, to our system and uh, that we have an, um, a means of, of looking into people's weight trajectory they're not losing and things like that. So a 40-person, 12-week study. Um, now, obviously, building upon that five-person pilot trial that was published, so this is a, a very logical next step. Now, I know this is hypothetical and asking you to look into your crystal ball, but assuming it shows a beneficial effect and it is a positive intervention, do you think that would be enough to say time to change clinical practice and time to use this as a therapeutic intervention more broadly? I would think this is a, it's a crucial step to support that this is an important intervention. I think this would be a crucial step to, to create momentum and awareness uh, in a larger group compared to the pilot study to make a case that there is something to this intervention. And by the same time, I think in parallel, what we really need is a deep understanding. What is the pathway from changing your diet to changing behavior? What is in between what happens in the brain, especially that you can think differently about shape and weight, that you can think differently um, about all these eating disorder related behaviors that you do not have this this desire this this need to restrict that it's easier to eat normally again and uh, so I think that would be key to identify these metabolic mechanisms as a biomarker and mechanistic problem in those disorders and I think as as soon as we identify reliably a mechanism, then we can build our models and how we look at uh, anorexia nervosa in, in our case uh, from a much, much different and broader perspective. And in addition to the traditional neurotransmitter systems that look how, how do metabolic factors uh, come into play here, and that will also have really important broader implications of other psychiatric disorders because there's a lot of overlap as you know a lot of comorbidity and one can can expand a lot on that as well yeah i i just find this whole area fascinating to really be at the forefront of watching how science and medicine changes basically start with a hypothesis start with case reports then a small pilot study then you build on it with a bigger study then you also have to look at the mechanisms and then you put that together the clinical outcomes with the mechanisms to maybe study it further all building towards a safe and hopefully effective wider application of care but in the meantime there are people who need help now who want help now. So to have to sort of carefully give advice or, or give recommendations of what people can try now as we're learning more, it really is sort of seeing this field grow right in front of us, which is, which is pretty fascinating. And you're right on the forefront of it. So if someone listening um, wants to get involved in the study or has a, a loved one that they think might be good for the study, how do they contact you to find out if they're a candidate? Yeah, so we will have a um, link uh, on our website, and we've also publicized that. Uh, the um, study is currently still under Institutional Review Board review, so uh, the university makes sure that everything is safe. It goes through uh, several review panels, and uh, we hope that uh, by August one at the latest, we can really get started with the study. So we will uh, publicize that on the UCSD website and uh, we'll also use uh, public uh, social media platforms to publicize the, the study, how to get enrolled and, and so forth. So sorry, your microphone got like muffled there. Did you say it was August, August was the date? One, August 1. August 1, our, okay, uh, very good. Perspective date. Right. We were hoping a little faster, but it just takes a while until the, uh, all these processes that need to be in place and. Uh, that they're um, well taken care of.
Now, when someone hears about a study like this and someone hears case reports, they're, I mean, for especially for a condition like anorexia that doesn't have great treatment where we've heard people sort of, a lot of them use the term give up hope and they're looking for something. A lot of people want to grab onto something and say, oh, this could work. I'm going to start it tomorrow. So we also have to say that we're doing this research to prove it's safe and effective, right? Both very important. So what kind of safety advice would you give to the person listening and saying, is that something I can do now? I would rather discourage from that uh, because we don't, to be fair, we don't know exactly in larger groups how it works. That's why we need really larger groups of individuals. I think our pilot data are very promising, but I really want to emphasize caution. Uh, also, in the purview of the potential, if you don't do it right, you might lose weight and things like that, which might be more to your detriment. So I really want to urge caution and uh, rather see to get into a clinical trial because there we are very cautious and careful to make sure that uh, there are no, no safety problems coming up. And so I, I, would, I would really like to encourage folks to get into uh, the clinical trial and not do that at home uh, without proper supervision. Very good. Well, I look forward to having another interview with you sometime, hopefully in the not too distant future, where we talk about the findings of this study and what the implications might be. So thank you for all your work and thank you for taking the time to join us here at Metabolic Mind. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure.